Redemption story. It's been our sermon series for the whole month. How many of us have enjoyed this sermon series? I really have enjoyed studying, preparing, and usually when you study and prepare, you're internalizing it, and God ministers to you first. And then as he ministers to me first, I'm able to share it with conviction. And I'm grateful that the Lord gives us so much insight and revelation, and he reveals himself through his word. We're going to read a couple scriptures this morning, John 12 and 13, just one scripture, John 12 and 13, and I'm going to take you over to Luke chapter 19, 38 through 40. That second reference in Luke is the one I'm going to focus on more throughout our time together, but I want to give you two different uh, perspectives, from the perspective of John and from the perspective the perspective of Luke of what happened in the moment that Jesus entered into Jerusalem or was making his way into Jerusalem. So John chapter 12 verses 13 says, So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. Let's look at Luke's account in Luke 19, 38 through 40. Saying, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. In this reference scripture, he doesn't use Hosanna, but he says, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. I want you to go ahead and repeat after me. Your word is written in my mind. Your word is hidden in my heart. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light for my path. I will seek you with all my strength. I choose, I choose to live my life according to your word. Your word, O oh Lord, is eternal. Today's subject is called the truth of praise. I want to speak to you about praise and what is the truth of praise. Now just for a moment, I want you to imagine that we are less than a week away from the crucifixion. The sound bites, the shouts, the praises. These individuals, they were all full of excitement and hope. Three out of four gospel accounts say they cried out, Hosanna. While Luke's account, they shouted, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Now when they shouted, it was a declaration of praise. When they shouted Hosanna, in Hebrew it meant deliver us, save us, rescue us. In, in one tone, it was a shout of joy. And in another, it was a shout of desperation. How many of us have those shouts before? Sometimes you can have shouts of joy and desperation at the same time. Their shouts were full of hope. But I want you to know it was also very prophetic. Zechariah chapter 9 verse 9. The Bible predicts this day will come. And it says, rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout out loud, hey, da O daughter of Jerusalem, behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a coat, the foal of a donkey. Zechariah, prophet, wrote this prophecy 600 plus years before Jesus was even born. Consider that. That God speaks to a man then he tells the people of Israel that there will be a Messiah. That there will be a king that is coming that is righteous and will come with salvation. That he will be humble and mounted on a donkey. Not just any type of donkey but on a coat. In other words a baby donkey. I need you to understand something about a donkey is that a donkey is not disciplined. A baby donkey is not disciplined. It is not trained. 
It is, it is a wild, it can be a wild animal because it doesn't know its order. But yet Jesus is riding on an untamed donkey, but yet when he's on it, it is tamed. Matter of fact, when we talk about, we don't talk about the donkey as we, as we do as much about Jesus. Why? Because the donkey never interfered with Jesus. The donkey never tried to be in the spotlight. The donkey was just a vessel. And God told the disciples, go find me a baby donkey. I want to tell you that when God uses you, he doesn't want you to take the spotlight. Spotlight. All he wants to do is use you as a vessel. But all you got to do is be used and get out his way. Be used, get out his way. Jesus is the one that shall be highlighted. Prophecy is revealed truth. 600 plus years have passed. And now we have a revealed truth that is taking place. I want you to know that Jesus is both the revealer and the revelation of God. He is both. The term revelation is to make known and God has made himself known through the person of Jesus Christ. God and Jesus are one and the same. And the Bible says in Colossians 1.15, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He is the visible image of the what? Invisible God. So God incarnate is riding on a baby donkey as praises are being lifted. And the Pharisees told Jesus to rebuke his disciples. The Pharisees wanted Jesus to rebuke. Not solely to silence them, but this is key, but to correct them. Correct their praise. The Pharisees wanted Jesus to make it known and to tell them, that the Israelites are misplacing their praise. The Pharisees wanted Jesus to shut down their praise. Tell them you are not here to save them. Tell them that you are not here to rescue them. Tell them because there are some that truly believe that you're the Messiah. Correct them. Shut down their praises. In Latin, praise comes from a word meaning value or worth. To praise God is to proclaim his worth. We are placing his value in our lives through our praise. So when we're shouting Hosanna, they're connecting their praise to the one who is coming to save us. When they're shouting Hosanna, they are placing the value of who he is. And the Pharisees try to shut it down. I want you to write this down. The enemy will try to dispute your praise. He will try to dispute your praise. To dispute something is to debate. And sometimes praise, it just doesn't make sense. Sometimes praise doesn't make sense. Why? Because when we talk about praise, we are not talking about conditional praise. When we talk about praise, we're not talking about praise of understanding. I'll praise him if I understand. I praise him if only God does this for me. That's not true praise. Praise is it doesn't matter if you're praising God for the good or for the bad. Praise, it is not conditional. For the Pharisees, it just didn't make any sense. How is this possible that these individuals are giving this man this type of praise when he is not even king on this earth? He doesn't have the position. He doesn't have the money. He doesn't have the status. But can I tell you, you know what Jesus did have? He had the anointing. You, you know what Jesus did have? He had the influence. Because though he didn't have everything, he had everything. Though he did not come on a horse and come with this full armor. Though he did not come as a king would come. 
he still had a multitude of people that followed him. How is this possible? They didn't see Jesus as the one who has come as the Messiah, the Pharisees. They didn't understand why people started following this man. So instead of isolating themselves and calling on God, because this is, listen, Pharisees are religious people. Right? They held up the Mosaic law. So, so the prophecy of Zechariah, they read that scripture. They, 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 they have said the scripture. They have rehearsed that scripture. So now that the Messiah is right before them, there is a blinder that is, that is in the way of them seeing the prophecy being fulfilled. So instead of them isolating God because they are religious people and talking to the Father and saying, God, would you give me discernment? God, would you speak to me? Because let's just be honest. There are Pharisees that have witnesses, witnessed miracles from God. God, I have seen things that I've never seen another man do. God, I've heard this man speak. And God, i got to be honest. When he speaks, it pulls me in. God, would you reveal your truth to me? So instead of the Pharisees going before the Father in prayer to bring clarity to what they are witnessing, this is what they did. They debated. And not only did they debate, they conspired against him. Not only did they debate, they conspired. The Pharisees just kept trying to trap God with blasphemy which is heresy against the law of God. So they got mad when Jesus healed a man in the temple on the day of the Sabbath because the law stated that is considered work. How can you heal a man in the temple on the day of the Sabbath? So they could not reconcile what they have been witnessing. So we can talk about people who are not religious all day long. We can talk about they all day. We can talk about people who have no faith all day long. And, and I've shared this last week. Why are we mad at people who are not religious? And why are we mad at people that don't have a relationship with God? We should expect the way that they are because they don't have a relationship with God. Don't get offended. When they're living a lifestyle of sin, don't get offended if what they speak is sin. Don't be offended if what they defend is sin. But to the religious people, to those who declare God as their Lord, it was the religious people that betrayed Jesus. It was the religious people that arrested him. It was the religious people that crucified him. See, our praise might have begun because of an experience. Our encounter with God has changed our view of him. He came in. He restored something in you. He changed something inside of you. And your view of God has changed forever. But our praise once saved is not confined only to good times. Our praise is elevated even in bad times. Our praise, again, is not circumstantial. Our praise is that God is good whether I'm healthy or sick. God is good, whether I'm rich or poor. God is good, whether I'm grieving or in gladness. It doesn't mean that you got to like what's happening. But it should never dispute against your praise to your God. I might be in a storm, and even so, I'm going to praise him through the storm. So you have to understand that many of those who are shouting, Hosanna! They were witnesses and some were recipients to a miracle. They heard Jesus teach. They watched Jesus move, which greatly impacted their life. Being in Jesus' presence, it changed something within them. It caused them, just like you, just like me, it caused us to see things differently. See, we pay a lot of attention to the fact that those the, the, the many who cried out, Hosanna, were doing so because it, it was a political cry of salvation. So, so to all to my Bible scholars here today, we're saying, well, Pastor D, but, but their cry, the, all of their cries were, were not real. It wasn't genuine. Let me, let me, let me, I want you to walk with me here for a moment. 
The Bible says that the Pharisees told Jesus to rebuke his what? Disciples. He didn't say rebuke them. The Pharisees didn't say rebuke them. He said to rebuke your disciples. To be a disciple means that you're a follower of Jesus. They weren't making reference to those who were not followers of Jesus. They were making reference to those who were following Jesus. You know what following Jesus means? It means that you believe. It means that you follow and adhere to his teaching. The term disciple is not, is not something that was new. There are many disciples. The Bible teaches us that John the Baptist had disciples. And even when there was a discussion about John the Baptist's dis uh, disciples and, and having discussion about John the Baptist because John the Baptist was a bad boy. John the Baptist made it clear that the true one is Jesus. That I am leading you, not towards me, but I am leading you to the way. I am leading you to Jesus. This is why Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. Because if I am walking towards Christ and I'm in relationship with Christ, then you should follow my lead. So when you are a disciple, the term is first mentioned in the Gospels, and Jesus uses it often. But not all disciples, here we go, who cried out, remained faithful. We know one by one, the Bible teaches us that they left Jesus. One in particular, Judas. Judas was a disciple. Judas was a follower of Jesus. I don't care what anybody says. Judas followed Jesus because he truly believed. Somewhere down the path, he lost his way. He left everything to follow him. Why would you leave everything to follow him than to betray him? He did what he needed to do. God trusted him. But Judas betrayed Jesus. You know, one can assume that Judas was there and participated in the praise, shouting, Hosanna! We, we know Judas betrayed Ju uh, Jesus with a kiss for what? 30 silver coins. And the sad part of that story is that once the betrayal happened and they gave him his coins, he didn't even keep it. He didn't even use it because it wasn't worth it. He felt so guilty and so shameful that the spirit of suicide convinced him it's better for him to take his own life. We also know that Peter, after his cry out, Hosanna, denied Jesus three times. After it was predicted by Jesus, soon after his arrest. There he goes, Peter. Hosanna! Hosanna! You see, you got to understand that Jesus many times was telling the disciples and others, it's not time yet to make this public. It's not time yet to make this public. In one of the gospel accounts, you would see that Jesus heals a blind man. And now you're starting to see that Jesus is coming out. So when we're talking about Palm Sunday, we're talking about Jesus having a come out party. Jesus is now saying, it is time. I am going to make the world know who I am. The time is now. This is why Jesus did not stop them, stop them from praising him. Because it was time for the world to know who he was. Now, I know that many of us, we use these big hyperbole terms and say things like, all, oh, all. Oh. I understand that there were some, maybe even many, that their intentions of their shouts, Hosanna, was not genuine. But I truly believe that there are still some faithful ones who believe and adhere to God's word. The same way that I would tell you this. If someone hurts you and we use terms like all, we have now just taken something that one person did and created a narrative that it's not even true. People don't even come to church because a hurt person hurts a person. 
And they use the church like this. The church are full of hypocrites. My response is, duh. What did you expect? That's why we're in church. Because we need Jesus to clean us up. To help us. To correct us. To discipline us. To disciple us. I don't see you saying the same thing when you need to go ahead and go to Target and buy some clothes. Oh, there's a whole bunch of hypocrites in Target. Oh, there's a whole bunch of hypocrites in Walmart. Oh, there's a whole bunch of hypocrites in, in McDonald's. Oh, there's a whole bunch of hypocrites. A whole bunch of hypocrites. But why is it when it comes to the church, there's a whole bunch of hypocrites. I'm not going to church no more. Someone might have hurt you, but you can't take that one incident and then begin to create a narrative that's not true. I would never go back to New Life Covenant because everybody knows my business. 99.9% .9 of people in this church don't even know your name. They're like... Not some... There might have been many, but I do believe that there was a few that were shouting. I do believe that there were some that were shouting Hosanna. And it was pure. And it was true. So, so while the enemy will try to dispute your praise, I want you to write this down. The enemy will try to silence the truth of your praise. He will try to silence the truth of your praise. John 8, 31 and 32. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him. If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. And you will know the truth. And the truth will set you free. Praise comes from knowing the truth. Tra praise comes from believing in Jesus abiding in his word and the bible says and the truth will set you free yes many who cried out praise hosanna denied jesus because soon after we know the bible the saints the the the, the few the some the many that that shouted hosanna turned on jesus and started to shout crucify him but when you believe in the truth, when you believe and abide in his word, Jesus now creates a framework of what a real disciple is. Because there's a lot of self-claimed disciples that do not follow through. So when Jesus preaches truth, People either have to receive the truth or reject the truth. So let me take you to John 6, 6, 6. Check that out. John 6, 6, 6. Let me take you to the scripture because Jesus is teaching. And the Bible says, after this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. What that means is that they were disciples. They were people who believed. But somewhere down the line, they heard something. They experienced something that no longer lined up to their own ideologies, to their own understanding, where they told themselves, this is where I draw the line. There are many disciples who believe. But God says, believing is just not good enough. The devil believes. There are many disciples who believe, but God says in order for you to be considered a true disciple, not only do you got to believe, but you got to adhere to my word. You got to be a doer. You got to follow my word. So when Jesus was teaching, he tells the people, I am the bread of life. And if anyone eats of this, would never go hungry again. And then he says, are you thirsty? 
He goes, I am the living water. And if you drink of this living water, you would, no go, you would never go thirsty again. And the disciples who first believed, well, you said, well, what did they believe in? Let me tell you what they believed in. Those who saw Jesus, they could not dispute the fact that this man had something different about him. They have seen the supernatural. They have seen Jesus lay hands on people and heal. They had seen this man teach and something was ministering to them. They believed he was a powerful man. Some possibly believed that he was a second coming of Elijah. Many believed he was a great prophet. What a great rabbi. What a great teacher he is. But the moment that they were challenged to believe that he is more than that. Was the moment that many have turned and walked away from him. I believe that there are people in this room as I speak right now. You have walked away from God. And you have walked away from God because of your circumstances. You have walked away from God because you just couldn't understand. How is it possible for a God who is more than capable of doing anything. Not come and help me when I most needed him. How can God allow this to happen in my life? Maybe life just got too busy for you. And because of that, one day turned into two days. And two days turned into three days. And three days turned into a week and a month. And you, and you look back and you're saying, my God, when was the last time I went to church? How many of us, we want to be a follower of Jesus? Okay, listen to me. If you want to be a follower of Jesus, the Bible teaches us that Jesus went to church every single week. Oh, no, Pastor, I don't have to go to church every single week. I just asked you the question, how many of us want to be like Jesus? It's a simple question. No, Pastor, you don't, you don't understand. I got kids. I, I, I didn't ask you how many kids you had. I just asked you how many of you guys want to be like Jesus. Well, you don't understand, Pastor. I got this going on. And... No, no, I didn't ask you all that. See, why does all that have to come and interfere with the simple fact of the question asking you, how many of us want to be like Jesus? I'm not talking about perfect attendance. I'm just talking about your drawing near to God so that can, God can draw near to you. See, this is steps. You've got to be careful because what happens with a lot of people, they'll be like, man, I, I, like, I, I like to watch online. This is for my online people. I love you with all my heart, but I'm going to bring you truth. I am so blessed for online. Let me tell you why. Because there are real people that are watching online that physically cannot come into this place. I'm grateful for online because there are a lot of unchurched and unsafe people that many of you tag them and say, you got to listen to the service. Hey, you got to check this thing out. And they won't enter into a building, but they'll watch what we stream. It has its purpose. But I want to tell you that there's a lot of Christians who've taken a step back instead of taking a step forward. And what I mean by that is that they've taken a step back and they've decided, I'm going to make my church through online. Here's the problem. Church is not the service. What you don't recognize is that what you are backing away from is community. What you are backing away from is fellowship with one another. You can't fellowship with your brothers and sisters. You can't even tell your story to your brothers and sisters. You, you, you can't do that when, when you are in the online and in that moment. It has its place. But what am I telling you? I'm telling you what Paul says. Do not neglect in coming together like others have. So when we're looking at our life and we want to be followers of Jesus, we got to go all in. And we got to adhere to his word because the Bible teaches us that when it comes to the church, the church is made up by the people. It is ecclesia. If you and I are not in the building and we just have this building, that's not church. The fact that we're able to come together and praise him and we're doing it because we're with each other. That is encouraging and this is what Jesus wants. But for some people, their praises were conditional. So they were taking steps backwards. 
to the point where they have fallen away from God. Be careful that you don't turn into a seasonal Christian. Be careful that you don't start making compromises after compromises. I love you too much to not tell you the truth. This is the place we got to gather together so that we can learn and encourage one another with the word of God. This is why we got life group so that we can be in communities, not in this place, only in this place, but in houses and, and in coffee shops. For some, their praises were conditional. But those who are true followers of Jesus, our praises are unconditional. How many here today are not going to allow what we don't know or understand to dictate our praise? We're not going to allow that. So when I'm in a storm, I'm going to find a reason to praise God. I, I may be in a storm, but I still got a roof over my head. I, I might be sick, but I got breath in my lungs. I, I might be a widow, but I have a family who looks out for me. I might be single, but I got friends. I'm going to look for praise. I'm not going to look at life half empty. I'm going to look at life half full. And what that means, I've got more until I experience my overflow. I praise God for his faithfulness because when I doubted, he was patient with me. I'm going to find a reason to praise. Let your praise articulate your sentiment of who Jesus is to you and what he has done for you. Let your praise be prophetic and full of hope. Jesus told the Pharisees, and I close it here. He told the Pharisees, I won't shut down their praise. I will not rebuke them because if I do, the praises will come from the rocks. If I do, the rocks are going to cry out. Jesus used the rock. Why a rock? A substance with no emotions, a substance with no feelings, a substance with, with no thoughts or life as a hyperbole in describing that truth cannot be shut down. And while some would try and others will walk away from it, the praise is lifted is the faith one has in the truth. So I tell you this, I won't be quiet. My God is alive. How can I, I keep it quiet. inside of me? My God me? is alive. How could I keep it inside? I won't be quiet. My God is alive. How could I keep it inside? Yes, no way. Here we go. Praise Him despite of. Here this morning, we're going to do just that. I'll praise in the valley. I'll praise on the mountain. I'll praise when I'm sure. I'll praise when I'm doubting. Come on, sing that in the atmosphere. I'll praise when I'm numbered. I'll praise when surrounded.
I'm not conditional. My praise is unconditional. I recognize. 